Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so uh, what I would like to talk about is, uh, so to say, another branch of uh, computer science, where uh, category theory plays a quite a uh, quite a sufficient, uh, quite uh, quite a big role there, and it allows us to actually unify different concepts in in uh, in automata theory uh, in the categorical language. So what I would like to uh, talk about first is motivation. So I'll briefly, briefly discuss basic uh, uh, automata theory uh, notions and then why category theory plays a role there. So let's start with examples. A, a very standard example uh, of something that is very computational-like is a labeled transition system. It, it describes, in a way, uh, a transition from a state to a state with a given, uh, where's the, does the, sorry, the, the, no, it doesn't work, sorry. Ah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, it's, it's here. Um, so you see, uh, these two pictures, in these two pictures you have uh, states being the circles, either colored in blue or, or red, uh, the transitions here are, are labeled with a certain action. Uh, so from, from a state here, you, you can either open a door and move to here, or open a door and move to here, and either, it's, it's a game, right? Win, win, win car with flowers, or whatever other thing you can imagine. Uh, so basically a label transition system is a set of states, and transitions between them, each and every transition being labeled with something, with an action, it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, and we like to talk about these uh, objects. A very nice example of how these label transition systems play a certain role in, in computer science is when, when you write a code, actually two codes here, very, very basic programs, uh, that can be easily represented in terms of, a, uh, in the, in terms of two label transition systems. Uh, one, the first one, I'm sorry, the first one here represents the program, uh, th this program, right? And the second, the second label transition uh, system here represents the second program on the right hand side. Uh, you see these two programs are in fact different, but they do the same thing. They just print 1010 zero, zero all the time. Okay? It's in, in, these are infinitely uh, working uh, programs, infinitely uh, time-wise speaking. And they give you the same, uh, they give you the same uh, output. So, uh, and this is a very, very specific example, yet we want to be able somehow to say, so these are two different transition systems, yet we want to be able to say that they behave alike, okay? Uh, so we introduce a notion of a bi-simulation. Uh, so it's a relation which makes a, sort of a, says that one state behaves like the other one. It's a very, very uh, broad notion, yet uh, a natural one in this context. So why am I talking about this, and where, where, does, where does the category theory play a role here? Well, if you move to different, uh, different systems, and if you try to do computer science, not with label transition systems, but there are a plethora of examples of different systems that do slightly different things than just the label transition systems, you sort of observe the same, uh, the same uh, pattern, the same different, different concepts, yet very alike. So what, what do I mean? Okay, so uh, there's this concept of, of a deterministic automaton, or maybe a non-deterministic automaton, very known and very fundamental to computer science. These two concepts are very alike to label transition systems, uh, yet there's this small differences. So in, in deterministic automaton, uh, the, the function, the graph, like here, uh, couldn't be, non this is a non-deterministic case, okay? You have the same action, uh, from a state labeled with the same label, yet uh, you have a possibility to either move here or here. In, in the deterministic case, you don't have this possibility. Uh, moreover, in the context of deterministic automata and non-deterministic automata, what is important is the notion of final states or terminal states. So you specify a certain uh, set we call F of special set, uh, states, and now Instead of a graph like in the previous uh, slide, you have a graph which is roughly speaking almost the same, except for the fact that some of the states are 
intentionally labeled with double circles saying that these are final, okay? So what's the change? Basically speaking, the change is the finality here. So you introduce this extra bit, extra piece of information into the structure about finality. Sometimes you don't want determinism uh, only, so you, you consider non-deterministic. Sometimes you want uh, no non-determinism. So you want to have explicitly only deterministic objects. Uh, but then you can pr proceed and consider, for instance, probabilistic automata, where instead of transitions as such being pairs of uh, elements, you want to consider a distribution. In this case, uh, we can make it simple enough to, to, have, uh, to have a discrete distribution, probabilistic distribution, where you don't have a possibility to move from a state to another state, where, but instead you have a probability of moving to a certain state with a given value. Okay? So uh, what I mean now by, by showing you this example is the, the following thing. Uh, there's a plethora of different examples. There's this wide range of different examples that seem to be to an extent alike that in a way, I don't say miss a common framer because that's mm, it, it, to, to some extent no longer the case, but they want, they, there was this need for a common framework. One could reason about these examples uh, in a nice, uh, in a systematic way, okay? And therefore, category theory, okay? That's, that's the main reason. Uh, that's the main reason why I give uh, this talk. So uh, I don't want to say it's the best common framework for these examples, but it's actually a very nice uh, framework because all these examples that I mentioned, and, and there's like many, many more uh, that fit into this setting, have a very specific thing in common. They can be nicely, nicely considered in, in the categorical uh, perspective and uh, under the name of a co-algebra. So what is that? Uh, so now let's, let's start basic category theory. I don't want to go into very uh, complicated notions. Uh, we start with a category C, this is just a category, an F functor, and an endo functor on C, okay? So what's a co-algebra? An F co-algebra uh, is just a morphism in C going from X to F of X. That's it, basically. Uh, there's nothing to it. So this notion had, uh, had been considered previously, and, and it wasn't just uh, in the context of computer science, uh, because it's a na very, very natural dualization of the concept of, of an algebra. Uh, however, it, it has many, many applications in computer science nowadays, and there is this co-algebra co field is uh, thriving. Uh, Bartek is w well aware of this. Uh, uh, so all the systems that I mentioned in the previous couple of slides are actually instances, or can be thought of as instances, of, of this co-algebra notion. So labeled transition systems, the first example I considered, uh, when you consider F, the functor, to be the power set functor times the, uh, uh, power set composed with uh, sigma times uh, the identity functor, it turns out these co-algebras turns out to exactly model what we uh, wanted in terms of labeled transition systems, okay? Non-deterministic automata, you drop the P, uh, you drop the P, the, the power set functor, right? You drop it and instead you have this uh, two times part which specifies which states are final and which are not final, okay? So that's just this basic, uh, basic piece of information I told you about in a deterministic automaton, there's this final, uh, final subset of states. Finally, the non-deterministic, okay, not finally, but uh, the non-deterministic automata uh, is a variation where you on top of sigma times it, put the power set functor back again. But you can also, uh, you can also by using the power set uh, functor properties, you can also the, put the two inside the, inside the functor. The probabilistic systems uh, also are modeled in the same uh, similar way, okay? So you have the functor here instead of P, instead of the power set functor, you have the uh, probability distributions functor, and that's it, okay? So you put the whole thing uh, put different examples into one single common categorical framework and are, you, you are finally able to reason about it in a unified way, okay? In a unified way. So I mentioned this, I mentioned this uh, notion of bisimulation for labeled transition systems. I gave you an example. Uh, it turns out, so this is, not exactly how you should uh, do it, but this is the, the, the fastest way to present it. Uh, it turns out that the bisimulation for label transition systems uh, uh, 
once, when you look at it at the level of category theory, is in fact simply a kernel of a homomorphism. You, you, you define a homomorphism between two coalgebras in a very natural uh, way, the same way you do it for algebras. And a kernel of a homomorphism is a by simulation. And everything that works there can be nicely restated in this uh, common uh, categorical framework. Uh, okay, so the tricky, tricky part here is uh, the notion of trace semantics, uh, which I will not go into details, uh, but I want to emphasize one thing. The choice of C here uh, depends on what you want to achieve, depends on what you want to get. Um, if, you, if you start with C, the category C, the basic category, being the category of sets and maps, and you work with this functor, so you obtain label transition systems where the homomorphisms are just standard maps, standard set maps, uh, and they give you the natural notion of, of uh, by simulation. However, you can start with C being slightly something else. For instance, if you start with C being the Claisley category for the power set monad, because the power set monad is, is, is a monad, this is a monad, uh, then it turns out that the coalgebras you get are exactly the same. So these are the label transition systems, but the morphisms aren't the strong uh, by simulation morphisms. They, they are related to trace semantics. So this is language equivalence for, uh, language equivalence for non-deterministic automata, uh, which is, I don't want to go into details here, but it's a, it's a nice, nice thing where you, moving around and changing from category to category, you obtain different notions of behavior equivalence. Um, so this was, uh, this was done, roughly speaking, in the 90s and early 2000s. And then this, uh, this whole field uh, is evolving into different directions. And I would like to talk about one of the directions uh, where it is, uh, well, I'm to, to an extent present in, with internal moves. So uh, again, for all these notions that I mentioned, uh, independently, at least, uh, in many cases, uh, there was this need to introduce this special, special transition which doesn't do anything. Basically speaking, so far, uh, the, the transitions that were mentioned actually meant something, okay? Something meaning, meaningful, something observable. Uh, however, every now and then there was this need to have this like silent move. Uh, let's, let's consider these two programs which again basically do the same thing. They just print one. However, the second program kind of in the first step it does pretty much nothing and then just prints one, okay? This, this guy here. So uh, in terms of, if I want to represent this program in terms of a, uh, of a level, in, in terms of a label transition system, I do it like this, and there's this special label tau, which is unobservable from the point of view of the observer, okay? Yeah, which is yeah, exactly unobservable. Uh, uh, so what are, what are, what are systems with silent moves? Well, what about the LTS? What's, what's a, uh, what's a syst uh, label transition system with silent moves? So it's just an ordinary system with a special tau uh, considered from the labeling set. However, you don't see the power of the tau when you just add it there. You want to be able to categorically, at least, I mean, this is, this is our aim here, right? So you want to be able to kind of give a meaning to this tau in a categorical perspective. And this is what I'm going to do, uh, try to do now. So where you see the power of tau uh, is when dealing with different notions of uh, behavior equivalence, when this tau actually plays a role of this silent step uh, action. So Let's consider one of the definitions now from the literature of the so-called weak by simulation, which wasn't considered before. Here, so a weak by simulation, uh, let's define it to be a strong by simulation on alpha star. And what is this alpha star? So alpha star is a system, is a transition system, which is obtained from alpha uh, by doing the following procedure. If, uh, so every step, is uh, every state uh, has a transition with the tau move to, to itself, then if there was a transition from x to x prime with a visible move and an invisible transition from x prime to x uh, double prime, then there has to be a, a transition with a visible move from x to a double x prime. Uh, 
And in a similar way, if you change the order of tau and a, here you get a, uh, you get a rule saying how to, uh, you get a rule saying how to obtain this alpha star uh, in this context. So there's no category theory involved so far. However, uh, what I want to emphasize is when you look at these three rules, they kind of show you the, the, what, what tau actually is or how it behaves. The silent move uh, is to an extent neutral to the structure of the visible part, okay? So if you were compared to something, uh, algebraically speaking, if you were to compare, uh, compare it to something uh, known, well known, that would be like a unit in a monoid, like, okay? So that's exactly how, how, this, uh, how this nice comparison works. And that's actually not a, not a surprise uh, because it turns out, and I will, uh, well, show you the description in a minute, that this in fact, the tau part is in fact a unit of a monad structure on the LTS functor here, okay? So the tau moves are part of the unit of the monad, okay? So it's, it's a, in, in the categorical sense. Um, okay, so this is a historical summary of what coalgebras with, with internal moves were in the literature originally. So they all started originally as structures of this uh, type. However, uh, what I did show uh, two or three years ago was uh, that if you uh, have a rich enough monad T, you can always impose a monadic structure on this functor, T F tau, so that you hide the tau moves inside the monad structure and, sorry, I, I want to show you this, uh, this slogan, and, system, and model systems with internal moves as coalgebras over a uh, over a functor which is a monad, okay? Over a functor which is a monad. Um, so how is this monad, uh, how does this monad work for a label transition system uh, functor? So the label transition system monad, uh, I, I'm not specifying the multiplication of the unit here explicitly. What I'm doing instead is just giving you the composition in the Kleisley category uh, for this monad. Uh, so if you have, which, which is roughly speaking uh, described in terms of these three uh, diagrams. So if you have a visible and invisible uh, label, then you just have in the composition, you're gonna have this. If you have invisible and visible, you have this in the composition. And finally, if you have visible and visible, if you compose the two, you just destroy the, the piece of information that follows from it. So there's no, uh, there's no transition from X to Z. Um, okay, so what do, we, what, do we gain by this, uh, what do we gain by this observation and how does, this, uh, how, how does this play a role in, in the field of algebras? Well, as I already said, uh, systems with internal moves now can be modeled as algebras over a monad. So what we can do, and this is the crucial part, is uh, because we're always, algebra is a, is a map from X to now TX, okay? From X to TX. If you consider it in Kleisley category for T, you can compose it around with different things, okay? So the gain from this observation is that systems, uh, automata, uh, probabilistic systems can be now composed with one another and you can use some other categorical constructions like different adjunctions in different uh, categories to obtain different new things from this, uh, from this field. Uh, and I would like to talk about the saturation uh, specifically uh, and its general categorical context. So what's the saturation? I've already, roughly speaking, described this on a very, uh, uh, on a very simple example of alpha star. Remember, uh, if you start with a label transition system, alpha, alpha star is obtained by adding those extra transitions, uh, the tau loops for every state, and whenever there's a tau step and a visible step, so you add this extra step, okay? So this is how alpha star is obtained as a general. If you want to, uh, if you want to use the notion uh, that I just introduced, so the composition in the Kleisley category for the LTS monad, the alpha star, the saturation of a label transition system, is simply obtained as a transitive and uh, reflexive transitive closure of alpha. So now, all of a sudden, um, the well-known construction of an alpha star that was known from the literature can be nicely described in terms of a categorical language uh, as a, a 
reflexive, this is the reflexive part, and transitive closure of alpha. Okay, so uh, this goes beyond labor transition system, just to, just to be clear. It's far, far more general. Uh, how, we, how can we, therefore, how can we, uh, in the general context, describe this process of, uh, of saturation for different systems? Well, uh, what's a saturated map? Let's start with that. So a saturated map, intuitively speaking, it should be a reflexive and transitive map. Okay, these two things, the reflexive and transitive. Can you, can you define this concept? Can you find this notion in the categorical sense? Well, actually, yes, you can, as long as you, you are uh, equipped with an ordering on home sets. So if you start with a category uh, where you have a special order on home sets, then a reflexive transitive map is simply defined in terms of these two axioms, okay? In terms of B, that's just it, that's just this. This is a reflexive and transitive map. So what's a saturation then? Saturation is assigning to alpha the smallest reflexive and transitive map above it, alpha star, okay? This will be the saturation. Uh, in other words, the closure. By the way, just to, just to make a small note here, ordered categories, uh, so when, when you have a home set order, uh, home set ordering, um, they can be thought of as two categories. They just, they are simply, uh, they're simply two category entities. And if you ask yourself, what is a monad in such a category, in such a category, not on such a category, then a monad in an ordered category is simply this. This is a monad in an ordered category. Okay, so uh, all of a sudden, these computer science concepts where you have this weak by simulation on weird system uh, is nicely described in, in categorical language as assigning, uh, it is actually the free monad, con it's a free monad construction. Uh, there's this free, if, if you have a functor, you, you can always assign to it, a, okay, not always, but you can try to assign to it a free mon monad of this functor. So this exactly is taking a map and assigning a free monad over it. So this is the saturation. Uh, you can obviously uh, describe this procedure in terms of an adjunction, which I don't want to go into details in. Uh, it's possible. There are several uh, un unfortunate, there are several unfortunate uh, assumptions that are required to produce this, uh, to produce this construction. So not always does it work. Uh, and some examples I mentioned here fail to be put into this setting. So one example, and this is the most problem, was the most problematic, was the probabilistic systems. I mentioned to you at, at the very end, the probabilistic systems uh, are actually hard to deal with in this context because they, uh, all of a sudden, they don't seem to satisfy these, uh, these assumptions, uh, which I will not focus on. But what you do have in probabilistic systems is you have these two, you have these two axioms, you don't have left distributivity, okay? Um, so if you don't have left distributivity, you just obtain it. So there's this, there's this uh, categorical theorem uh, we had, we obtained, where you take a category theory, uh, where you take a category with an ordering and you embed it with, with special assumptions and you embed it into something which is left to distributive, which, because this is the point I was missing. Uh, and all of a sudden, everything plays nicely with the notions obtained so far. Uh, there's many possibilities for future work from here. Uh, uh, there's a paper of mine and my colleague on timed automata, where there's this notion of time and abstraction of time is nicely Again, put it into the framework of saturation where, the, where I, instead of a normal standard saturation like this, we use the concept of generalized one. There's also, uh, there's also a possibility to consider all this in the context of Buchi automata and uh, infinite behavior and see what happens then. Uh, and actually, it's an ongoing research I am um, conducting with my friend uh, because the saturation and the infinite behavior sort of play nicely with one another. And again, there is, this, there is, a, there is a very nice categorical description you can obtain. Uh, thank you for the attention. <laughs>